Um, I want to start by acknowledging my co-author. So Tamara Lebrecht not only did most of the organization for this amazing event, she also works for Jean Watch and was, is the leader author, lead author on this chapter. And Irina Castro is here somewhere. And she's uh, based at the University of Coimbra and provided social science expertise. Uh, so um, this issue has come al already. Uh, there's an important context here about R&D funding, how R&D is funding, how decisions are made, the role of patents, the issue of conflict of interest in science. So that's one aspect that we talk about in the chapter. We're gonna, we also talk about the consequences of the R&D funding system and particularly this issue of hype, the idea of over-promising in order to obtain funding. Uh, we talk about fully informed consent. There's an important question mark there, which I'm sure you all <laughs> understand why that's the there. Uh, we discussed the precautionary principle, which again has been mentioned several times. Uh, we talk about public engagement around these issues and we draw some conclusions. So to start with the context, um, it's very clear not just from the field of gene drive, but much more broadly around biotechnologies, but also other technologies, that hype around new technologies influences both the public and private R&D investment. So it's used as a tool to obtain investment in researchers. And the focus, as we heard already in the discussion this morning, is generally on technologies that can be patented. Uh, including genetic technologies such as gene drive and CRISPR. And the idea is that even if some of the applications are not commercial or are given away for free or whatever, the system is one in which um, something is patented, it's um, invested in, and that uh, then leads to innovation in the real world. Um, we know that conflicts of interest, commercial conflicts of interest, can jeopardize the independence of research. There's a vast literature, particularly in the medical field, but also many of you will be aware uh, of the issues around pesticides and the current controversy on glyphosate. So there's, there's a lot of evidence of commercial companies not only um, jeopardizing the independence of research in terms of the conclusions they draw about risk, but also actually influencing the entire research agenda and where the money is spent. But it's important to also note that bias is not limited to commercial interests. So we see uh, over-promising in order to secure research funding as, as something that's very routine now in universities as much as in the commercial field. Um, what are the consequences of this kind of R&D funded system? Well, you can write a book on it. In fact, I did write a big report on this once. But how research is patented and funded um, leads to unrealistic claims about what researchers can deliver. The claims are in the... I'm going to give you some examples in a minute, but you see the claims not just in the media. It's not just media-led hype. It comes from the claims made in patents and in uh, other... Science, supposedly more scientific documents, particularly in funding applications, of course. And many claims about the future benefits of gene drives as portrayed in the media and in scientific publications and in patent applications are at best premature. They're very speculative. So the complexity of the environment we've talked about in terms of particularly risks this morning, but in terms of benefits, in terms of how these applications will actually uh, achieve anything, whether they can really deliver anything. Uh, and the language and terms conveying these promises are already established in society well before this technology actually exists. So here's just a few examples. If you read the chapter, we have many examples of headlines and statements from the press, uh, where in effect, these headlines are saying, talking about the CRISPR machines that can wipe out an entire species, as if that's known. Um, a genetically modified organism could end malaria and save millions of lives if we decide to use it. So if you decide not to use it, you're deciding not to save millions of lives by implication. That's already there in the headline, even though this is not a proven technology, has not been released in the environment. And in fact, probably none of the versions that even currently exist in the lab are going to be released into the environment. And another example, powerful gene drive can quickly change an entire species. 
It's not just about the press. Uh, this is just one example of many again, but it's, it's a bid for funding. Uh, in fact, this is organized by the Harvard University Effective Altruism Student Group <laughs> for the Philanthropy Advisory Fellowship. But you can see claims such as the wording I underlined in, in red saying, although the initial cost to research and develop gene drive systems is high, that's obviously what they're trying to get investment in, um, it off once developed, it offers an incredibly cost-effective means of combating infectious diseases as the gene drive is capable of spreading itself with little additional cost or human intervention. Now, this is, you know, not only claiming effectiveness, but also cost-effectiveness and little human intervention, as if you wouldn't have to make repeated interventions to make further releases or control or otherwise deal with any of the consequences. So that's the kind of claim you see in funding bids. And this is uh, one of Kevin's patents. Um, the gene drives described herein have particular practical utility in the eradication of infectious diseases and the control of invasive species. So you can see the kind of claims that you're going to eradicate disease are already there in the patents at a very early stage. Uh, what are the implications of this kind of hype? Well, claims that this technology can wipe out a species and its associated environmental damage or disease ignore the many complexities and uncertainties that we've heard something about this morning. And that includes issues about the development of resistance, not only um, resistance in a molecular biology sense, of, of, uh, but also, you know, there's evidence from sterile insect programs that the females can also change behavior, their behavior can evolve to avoid mating with the sterile males, for example. So the whole system can evolve, uh, the disease can evolve, so it can move to a different species or a different, uh, you know, can... Uh, so, so there's all these complexities and uncertainties. There's the presence of multiple species. Um, so even the Anopheles gambi complex, that's basically seven species, uh, and how they interact is complicated. Um, so whether you, if you suppress one, will others move into this uh, ecological niche? How will the whole ecosystem evolve? Uh, but exaggerating effectiveness can also lead to opportunity costs. Um, and again, that was raised this morning. So if there's a claim that makes it sound as if gene drive exists as an already existing solution that we just have to decide to use or not, then that's taking money away, potentially, and human resources away from other effective solutions, including those developed in Africa. Um, Hype also closes down public debate, so it becomes very difficult to raise concerns about the risks if the debate is taking place in a context where infectious disease will be wiped out <laughs> if you will only accept this technology. So it closes down debate and closes down alternatives, not just in terms of existing alternatives, but discussion about the best way to develop knowledge collectively to tackle societal problems. Um, I'm going to say a bit about informed consent. Um, and the informed part obviously depends who's doing in the, the informing as well as whether you're in the dark or not. So fully informed consent has a question mark. I'm not going to talk about all the issues that were raised this morning, but what we looked at in the chapter were actually GM mosquito trials that had already taken place to date. So there's a UK company called Oxitec, which is owned by Intrex on the US company, which has already released uh, GM mosquitoes into the environment in several countries. Target Malaria has not done any releases yet, but has uh, approval, or says they have approval for release in Burkina Faso of GM mosquitoes, not with gene drive. So we can look at those processes, and in those processes we find, again, exaggerated claims of effectiveness. So Oxitec, for example, had a jingle. Its public engagement included a jingle in Brazil, a van with a jingle talking about the solution. Our mosquitoes are the solution. It wasn't saying they're an experiment, um, which they were, and they are not effective. Uh, there was failure to obtain fully informed consent in the sense of having a fully informed risk assessment. So uh, the processes were not followed 
We've heard about regulatory processes being important. In the case of Oxitec, every transboundary notification they were supposed to make under the Cartagena Protocol because they were exporting from the UK to other countries. None of those risk assessments met the required European standards, and there was no mechanism to actually enforce that. And in, certainly in the case of Panama, the risk assessments didn't even exist. They did a contained use risk assessment. They never did an open release risk assessment at all. So we can talk theoretically about these regulations, but we have to be aware that there needs to be enforcement and it needs to actually exist. And of course, when we move to thinking about gene drives, you have the much more fundamental questions that have already been raised about how do you actually do a risk assessment on gene drive organisms at all. We see also in these examples uh, power imbalances, as you would expect. We're talking largely about a transfer of technology from north to south. Um, the risk assessments that were produced were rarely consulted on. In fact, I don't think any of them were consulted on in terms of a public consultation. Uh, there was one public consultation in the US uh, for mosquitoes that were not actually released, but in the south, in other countries, there were no consultations. Uh, sorry, in Malaysia, there was a consultation, I should say. Um, and again, they stopped the release. Um, ignoring local skepticism regarding the benefits. So there's quite a lot of uh, skepticism in the countries where these mosquitoes are released actually about whether they will work. So in Brazil, for example, a lot of the public health experts do not think this technology will work and they were ignored in terms of the experiments going ahead. So that's experts being ignored. Um, uh, it, it, with target malaria, they've made some payments for local people to sit and expose their legs to mosquitoes to catch mosquitoes. For, um, that obviously illustrates uh, a power imbalance in the sense that they can pay people to expose themselves potentially to a higher risk. Um, and uh, quite a lot of evidence that women have not really had a say in many of these processes. Um, I'm going to say a little bit now about uncertainty and about the precautionary principle. That's already been raised as well. So a precautionary approach obviously involves adopting a cautious attitude towards risk, and that requires taking preemptive measures to avoid harm. And importantly, it considers some of the things we were talking about this morning in terms of the Im implications of incomplete knowledge, so ignorance and uncertainty. Um, and if we talk about precaution in the context of R&D and the decisions that we, we make about what innovations to actually develop, then it's about steering innovation. It's not blocking innovation, as some critics of the precautionary principle often claim. It's about the fact that innovation can take many different pathways. So taking a precautionary approach means that you're promoting a scientific pathway that embraces complexity and uncertainty with more humility and less hubris. So in the case of gene drive mosquitoes for malaria, this is just one quote from one paper about a few of the uncertainties. It's unknown how and how quickly mosquito and parasite populations would actually react to the introduction of GM mosquitoes. You can have rebounds in disease, as was discussed earlier. You can have other species moving in. You're going to have a very complex ecosystem response. It's unknown how many species would need to be transformed. So multiple species occurring, these diseases, it's not a simple thing of wiping out one species or even reducing one species to a threshold level. Um, and there are significant ecological uncertainties inherent to the complex and shifting disease ecologies of malaria. So this is a recognition that the ecology of the disease itself can also change in response to any intervention. Uh, so, when we talk about public engagement, we can conclude that meaningful engagement requires alternatives. So, it mustn't be just about a pathway to acceptance, where the point of the engagement is to get the public who are involved to say uh, that they want the technology or they want the technology with certain adaptions, but that they have a broader choice of different approaches to tackling the problem. So the public, public needs to be engaged in the definition of the problem and also uh, that needs to be broadened out to a broader societal appraisal, uh, which is problem-led 
and avoids these unrealistic promises that we're talking about. So you would, your starting point would be, for example, how to tackle malaria or how to tackle other problems that a community particularly want to be tackled. And you have to do it in an in inclusive and responsive way. And that requires also consideration about the role of scientists in that kind of discussion and the need for counter-expertise, which includes expertise that can be critical, as we are here in, in the context of critical science, which also requires its own funding, time and resources. So my conclusions are that public engagement are, is needed at the very beginning of the process, defining the problem set and setting the R&D priorities, so not after some organism is about to be released into the environment. We shouldn't be waiting until that point. We need to acknowledge ignorance, uncertainty, and the complexities and irreversibility of the future effects of gene drive organism releases. Um, we have to think about alternative approaches, and they have to be part of the engagement. So there's a choice. It's not babies will die if you don't have this technology. It's what is the best approach to reduce the number of babies who die, for example. Um, and particularly, public debate should not be framed by these unsubstantiated and, frankly, unrealistic claims about what gene drives can deliver. It's extremely difficult to actually deal with multiple mosquito populations in a way that will actually, in the long term, reduce infectious disease without a risk of rebound or other um, responses by the ecosystem. So genuine empowerment must, be, must not be conducted with the premise that the technology will be accepted. It has to have alternative approaches and alternative paths of development as part of the consideration. Thank you.